Good afternoon and welcome to Diving Deeper. Here we are. We're going to try to make this work because last week we had a technical glitch and we had plenty of video, which I'm sure you would want to look at me for the next hour, but no audio. So that was somewhat deficient, but we're going to try again this week. But we're on week five and the handout is on the, the website at www.churchofthemessiah.com. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And I'm surrounded by a bunch of biblical scholars who are here, and they are masked and socially distanced and everything, but you get to look at me. We're looking at Genesis chapter... Three today, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, give us this perfect world, perfect relationship, perfect man, perfect woman, though some might argue that those even exist, but chapter 3 is when they quit existing. We've got this perfect environment, perfect relationships with each other and with God. Sadly, it only lasted two chapters, because in Genesis chapter 3, it all falls apart, which is why it's called the fall. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The question gets asked, Why would God even make the serpent? Everything was perfect the way it was. Why would God even put a snake in there? Because if there's no possibility of our rejecting God, our love for him is meaningless. If there's no opportunity to disobey God, our obedience is meaningless. If there's no chance of faithlessness, our faithfulness is meaningless. If God wants children, and, because God wants children and friends, not slaves or robots. Now, Adam and Eve, one man, one woman, and the whole world. They hooked up. Can anybody blame them? <laughs> they had no other options, right? Okay. In today's world, every one of us who's married have had and options. Ideally, our parents didn't choose our mate for us. Uh, the computer may have put us together dating, but the computer didn't tell us we had to get married. We had some sense of choice in that. And one hopes that your spouse chose you out of all the other people in the world because he or she thought you were the most desirable, you were the smartest, you were the prettiest, you were the best, you were the most, you were the, you were the top. Because if you were the only man in the world and she was the only woman in the world and you end up picking each other, oh well. <laughs> but isn't it nice to know that you were the one that that person chose out of all those others? Well, if you had no choice, your choice doesn't mean anything. And that's how God is. He wanted to give us the choice. Because if he did not give us the choice, that's not really love. So God did not create evil. He did create the possibility of evil. He did not create unfaithfulness. He created the possibility of unfaithfulness. He gave us the opportunity and the chance, the option of choosing him or not, of Adam choosing Eve or not of us choosing the right way or the wrong way or not. So God created the possibility for evil and Lucifer took it. Now, where did the devil come from? Genesis chapter 3 doesn't say. But there are several other places in the Bible that give us some hints of perhaps where Satan came from. Okay, and we're going to look at those. In Revelation chapter 12, Beginning in verse 1, there's this war in heaven, and the serpent is there. And in Revelation chapter 12, it describes this war in heaven, that there's this big dragon serpent thing, and his tail sweeps a third of the stars out of the sky. In ancient times, people believed that the stars were angels. So when the dragon sweeps a third of the stars out of the sky, that would be a third of the angels. If you have heard, well, Satan rebelled against God and he and his armies fought against God, this is where that comes from. And if you've heard that, that demons are fallen angels, this is where that comes from. That Satan swept 
a third of the stars out of the sky, a third of the angels that joined him in his rebellion and his war against God. Okay. Then war, the, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, the war broke out, broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Michael is found in the book of Daniel as the leader of the armies of God. So you've heard of a, an archangel. Okay, Michael is an archangel. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time. What's the difference between an angel and an archangel? But Michael is a big guy. Okay, Michael is an important angel. And he is commanding the armies of God. So Michael and all of his angels are fighting against the serpent and all of his angels. Let's do the math. If the serpent swept a third of the angels, a third of the stars out of the sky, how many did that leave? Two thirds. Two thirds. So at this point, Michael and his army outnumber Satan and his army two to one. We like those odds. We like those odds. Okay. But he was not strong enough, This meaning the dragon. The dragon was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Someone asked uh, earlier, you know, where, how do we know that the serpent in the Garden of Eden was the devil? This is why. Revelation chapter 12. You've got to read all the way to the end to find out who it was. You can suspect. The evidence is there, but it doesn't really uncover it completely until Revelation chapter 12. Okay, so war in heaven, serpent and a third of the angels are kicked out of heaven. They come to earth. They're not happy about it. They come to earth to wage war against God and God's people. That would be us. Okay, so if you've ever felt like there's this war of good and evil going on around you or inside of you, that's true. So those cartoons you see where the guy's, somebody's trying to make a decision and poof, this angel pops up on one shoulder and poof, the little demon pops up on the other shoulder and they're both whispering into your eyes and you're trying to figure out which way to go. Well, that's actually biblical, not necessarily cartoon devil demons and angels, but or whispering in your ear. But the idea of a war going on inside of your mind, inside of your body, inside of your soul for your salvation and for whether you're going to do right or wrong, that is very biblical. So this war is going on, and we are, we're part of it. We're actually part of the spoils of war. Devil's trying to win us and eat us. God's trying to win us and save us. Uh, a great book to read about this is The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis that describes a lot of the devil's tactics and strategies. Uh, interesting, fascinating book. The, uh, so, okay, so we we know that this serpent in the garden is the devil, Satan, Lucifer, however you want to call him. Okay, how? Uh, what else do we know about this thing? In Ezekiel chapter twenty-eight, verses twelve through nineteen, in the in prophecy, prophecy often talks about something that's happening immediately but then also looks ahead to the future. And it sometimes talks about a person who exists at that time, but sometimes it also talks about a being that exists in some other time or realm. And that's what this is about in Ezekiel chapter 28, starting in verse 12. And actually what Ezekiel is talking about is the king of Tyre. Tyre is a city on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. It's a non-Jewish town place, non-Israeli, it's pagans, it's, um, it's Gentiles, it's non-Jews. And the king of Tyre uh, over and over again in the Old Testament is seen as a not a good guy. Okay, So Ezekiel's prophesying specifically against this particular king, but what he says about this king, readers throughout the ages have all said, that sounds a little like Satan. So let's see what he has to say. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 12, beginning uh, excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning in verse 12. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone adored you. And it lists a bunch of them. Topaz, onyx, jasper, lapis, luzi, turquoise, beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold, and on the day you were created, they were prepared. Now, the king of Tyre was obviously not in the garden of Eden. So that's one of the reasons that they're thinking, hmm, who else is this talking about? Because what beings were in the Garden of Eden? Well, it was Adam 
and there was Eve, and then there was that talking snake. Okay, okay, okay. We got a hint here that perhaps this was. Well, this whoever this was, was perfect in the beginning, created perfect. Verse 14, you were anointed as a guardian cherub. Ah, you were created as an angel. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. What? Can angels make decisions? It appears from the scriptural record that they can. We human beings get to decide whether we're for or against God. It appears that angels have that same kind of choice. Okay. So this angel, whoever, this king of Tyre, this, this angel that Ezekiel is talking about, was created in perfection, created there in the very beginning, was a, a very important, was blameless in your ways from the day you were created, verse 15, till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among, among the fiery stones. God kicked him out of heaven, which sounds like what happens in Revelation. Of course, Ezekiel didn't know that because Ezekiel is talking mm, 600 years before Revelation is written. Verse 17, your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings and by your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you and it cons consumed you. So this angel that was created was perfect and decided, you know, I like being perfect. I'm pretty. I'm, uh, I'm important. And apparently felt like he was too important and God kicked him out of heaven. Beautiful and proud, but because of his proud pride was thrown down. Okay, let's see what Isaiah has to say. Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 11. And... Once again, Isaiah is talking about some stuff that's happening then, but in verse 11, he starts out, All of your pomp has been brought down to the grave, along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out beneath you and worms cover you. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. Okay, you've heard of the devil called Lucifer. Lucifer comes from the Latin luce, which is light, which is the morning star, son of the dawn. James it names him King James, it names him Lucifer. Oh, Lucifer, son of the morning. Yes. Okay, so that's where that name comes from. It's from Latin, which means son of the dawn or morning star. So Lucifer was thrown down. You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. That Satan rebelled against God and was not satisfied with being an angel. No, I want to be God. Angel's not good enough. I want to be God. Verse 15, but you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. And those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the one who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The one who made the world a wilderness, who overthrew its cities and would not let its captives go home? Satan has a degree of power. But Satan is not the equal and the opposite of God. Satan has nowhere near the same power or authority of God. Though he wanted to, though he tried to set himself up that way, he does not. And if we see Satan for who he is as mere human beings, we would go, uh-oh, this is not good. But when we see Satan, when we are children of God, with all the promises that we have from God, that greater is the one who is in you than the one who is in the world. Greater is Jesus and the Holy Spirit who are inside of you than Satan who is in the world trying to mess things up and boss people around. Greater is he who is in you than that one. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. That for those of us as children of God, when we see Satan, it's like Toto pulling back that curtain at the Wizard of Oz. And 
what looks like this big horrendous lion roaring around seeking whom he may desire is actually this dried up little old man pulling levers and pushing buttons and shouting into a microphone. And we can say, who's saying, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Yes. That what happens to Satan is not necessarily punishment, but consequences. Yeah, right. And those two things are different. Uh, if I am walking down the street and there are cars zooming down, if I'm on the sidewalk and cars zooming down the street and I step off the sidewalk in front of the car, that's not punishment for disobeying the law. That's consequences. And so much of what we sometimes think in life are, is punishment are actually simply consequences. And God tells us, you know, live this way and it'll go well for you. Don't live this way. You've got the choice. You, you can choose. Yeah, I, I, I lay before you life and death, blessings and curse. It's up to you. Choose life. But if you choose to go that, if you choose to step off the road and step off the sidewalk into the road, you can do that. But that's unwise. Okay, so this Satan, the serpent, who was in the garden there in the beginning, God placed him there to give Adam and Eve the option of doing what God says or not. Now, St. Augustine of Hippo, a, uh, a guy in the uh, 400s who, pretty important thinker, says that we human beings were created with the power to sin or the power not to sin. That human beings, Adam and Eve, were created. They had both, they could choose to, to follow God or they could choose to disobey God. Once they disobeyed God, however, they lost the power to follow God completely. That once they sinned, Sin entered inside of them and infected their minds and their hearts and their wills and made them more selfish and that their selfishness now makes it so they don't have the power to do what's right all the time. They have the power to do what's right only some of the time. Okay? We've all experienced that, haven't we? Paul writes about it in Romans chapter 7 when he says, The things I want to do, I can't do. And the things that I don't want to do, that's the very things that I do. This war is going on inside of me. I want to do what's right, but I can't get it together to do it. And Paul points it out. He says, it's not me. It's sin inside of me. It's sin living inside of me. It's the selfishness that lives inside of me that infects me, that causes me to do what's wrong. Now, Adam and Eve did not have that sin inside of them yet. They still had the opportunity to do what was right or to do what's wrong. We know what happened. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 3. The serpent says to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman says to the serpent, Oh, we can eat any fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Okay? Did Eve quote God correctly? No. No. Because if you look back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Did God tell Adam not to touch it? No. Was Eve there when God gave Adam the rule? No. So where would Eve have heard this extra part of the rule? From Adam. Adam told her, don't touch, don't eat from that tree, don't even touch it. Exactly. Those of us who are parents have told our children things that we tried not only to get them not to do the stupid thing or the wrong thing, we tried to make the boundaries a little further out so that if they would not, if they didn't do this, they certainly wouldn't do that. And it appears that Adam did the same thing with Eve. Now, we would think that sounds like a smart thing to do because if she won't touch it, she won't eat it. However, 
We're going to find out that when you put too many rules on someone and they find out that those outer layers of rules don't really matter, there's no consequences to those, then the logical conclusion is the things in the inside don't either. Well, if that didn't, if I didn't die when I touched it, then I probably won't die when I eat it. And that's what exactly Eve finds out or what she thinks. Okay. The woman says, uh, you must not eat from the fruit that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. And the serpent says, you won't die. You won't die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, we're spending a lot of time on this first part of Genesis because this first part of Genesis is foundational for so much else of life and certainly so much else of our faith, hope, and love. And this whole business of how, how the serpent tempts Eve and what he says to her and how he says it and how he twists and how he tricks her and how he deceives her is the same way that he does with us. And if we understand how an enemy works, it's easier to recognize when he does it. You won't die. One of the first things that evil will try to tell you is pick anything that God says to do or not to do. And you get tempted to do it or not to do it. And one of the first things you is, ah, it won't matter. Nobody will know. Who's it going to hurt? You won't die. The serpent says the same things to us. You won't die. In fact, God told you not to do that because he's holding out on you. If you eat that, Eve, you'll become like God. Now, wouldn't you like to be like God? Of course. But we already are, as Helen just said. We are created in the image of God. We are already like God in many, many ways. Satan found out what happens if you try to set yourself up equal to or above God you get kicked out. Satan was not happy being merely an angel. He wanted to be above God. Are we happy being human beings and God's children, or do we want to be God? Not really. However, we want what we want when we want it. We, we like things to be the way we like them to be. And no, that's I the... I think it's good to strive for things. I don't think it's good to get it like plot. It is. Well, that hasn't happened to me in quite a while anyway. So Satan says, you won't die, but when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you'll know good and evil. You'll become like God. And your eyes will be, your eyes will be open. You'll know good from evil and you'll become like God. God tells uh, Satan, the serpent says four things. One lie and three pieces of truth. You won't die. Your eyes will be opened. You'll become like God, and you'll know good and evil. Those three things were true. The dead part was not immediate. Saying you won't die was a lie. But three other things that the serpent said was true. If I tell you four things, and three of them are true, it's mostly true, right? It's true-ish. Is that true? No. No. Is, but truthiness, doesn't truthiness count? No. No. It's either all true or if it's not all true, then it's not true. And that's the way the enemy comes to us. Jesus calls him a liar and the father of all lies. That any time evil says something to you or you think something from, from evil, there's a lie in there somewhere. It may look true, it may sound true, but somewhere in there is a lie. And when you find the lie, then that's when you know, I'm not listening to you anymore. Okay, so there's one lie and three truths. The lie is you won't die. You won't die immediately. But you'll, your eyes will be open, you'll become like God, you'll know good from evil. And then verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some. She picked it off the tree. She touched it. Did she die? Nope. So therefore, if I didn't die when I touched it, probably wouldn't die if I eat it, right? Did she die? Didn't die. Oh, obviously, God's lying to me. 
No. The other guy's lying to you. God didn't say you would immediately die. He said you would die. Okay. But he did say the day you eat it, what the test is. I think they died spiritually. They lost the Holy Spirit. And remember that we heard a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. Okay. So he did say he did say that. But the point of what the serpent says to Eve is why would don't worry about what God says. And Eve at this point has got to be thinking, why would God make such a stupid rule? It's a pretty piece of fruit. It's desirable. It's pretty. It tastes good. Why would God hold? God's holding out on me. And is that not what we tend to think when we bump up against a commandment? Something we want to do. Something I want to do, and we know it's not right, but, you know, gosh, it feels good, and it looks good, and it smells good, and it tastes good. And, and why would God, why would God deny me this? God wants me happy, right? <laughs> How can something that feels so good be so wrong? All of us have thought that. All of us have encountered that. All of us have had those thoughts. And I want you to know that those thoughts didn't arise from inside you. You had someone whispering in your ear. There are those who say, well, what's a spirit? A spirit is a thought. So some of the thoughts, yeah, come from inside of you. But have you ever, you know, you have those strange thoughts that jump in your head. Where did that come from? Well, you had a spirit whispering in your ear. Got a lot of spiritual perspective. Right. Uh, years ago, I was uh, I would go out walking in the morning, and early in the morning, I would walk past Health Central Park, the nursing home over here. And so it was early in the morning, and there was a gaggle of women who worked there who would get together before their shift, and they would go walking. And they they sometimes they would go the same route I did, and so I would be uh, I, I was coming back towards my house, and they were going the other direction. And there they are, and they're power walking. And I'm just walking, and I I, I looked up and I. I saw them, and, and they were wearing, you know, their walking clothes. And the thought popped up, well, that's the best thing you've seen all day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Why don't you tell them? I thought, where did that come from? I didn't say I, I looked the other way. At which the good news was that I did that was two weeks later, one of those women started coming to church here. <laughs> They would have been thrilled if you said, hey. Right. Right. They would have been thrilled. Yeah, we're going to go to church where the priest is hitting on women early in the morning. I don't think so. But when that thought popped through my head, I thought, where did that come from? But it didn't take long to figure out where that came from. And thank God I was smart enough to keep my mouth shut that morning. <laughs> Not always ever since, but that morning I had enough sense to look the other way and keep my mouth shut. But when those things pop into your head, you've got someone whispering in your ear a lie. That's the best thing you've seen all morning. Yeah, they, it, it was. Everybody else in my house was asleep and in bed when I left the house. Why don't you tell them? No. No, that was the lie. So Eve is thinking, why would God make such an unreasonable, pointless rule? She touches it, she doesn't die. She ate it and she didn't die. And then she gives it to her husband who was with her. Bible says she then gave it to her husband who was with her. All right. Where was Adam through this whole conversation, this whole interaction? He was right there. How do we know that? There's one woman in the world and she's naked. And he's a guy. Where else do you think he's going to be? Yeah, you're right. It's a good thing you didn't say anything to those women. Okay. Adam has been here for this entire interaction. Doing what? Watching to see what's going to happen. Why didn't he say, Eve, don't talk to snakes? Don't do that. He's watching. OK, those of us who are older brothers or sisters to younger brothers or sisters, remember watching them doing about to do something stupid or that, you know, that's going to get them in trouble and you just watch them. Or if you're a younger sibling, watching your older sibling do that. That's what Adam's doing. He's watching to see what's going to happen. 
You know, she touches it. She didn't drop dead. He's thinking, I got more ribs. <laughs> you know, God made one. He can make another. She touches it. She doesn't die. She takes a bite of it. If she doesn't die, she turns to him with a smile on her face. Naked lady with a smile on her face. Here, you want some? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, I'll take some too. She turned to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And then their eyes are opened. Oh, man. Oh, man. It says, verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Oops. I, I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Uh, those of you that have ever had dreams, and in your dream you're naked in public. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've had those dreams, and I, and I can remember in my dream like going, finding something to hide behind. That's why we wear vestments on Sunday morning. So <laughs> you don't know what we have on or don't have on underneath those. Vestments cover a multitude of sins. But imagine, imagine getting up some morning, taking your shower, forgetting to put on your clothes and walking out. How long do you think it would take before you realized you were naked? This is one of the great questions of the Bible. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? Uh, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, Who told you you were naked? Isn't that a great question? I mean, that is hilarious. Who told you you were naked? Uh, like you had never noticed before. No, they had never noticed before because the end of chapter 2 says they were both naked and unashamed because, A, they'd never heard of clothes. There was nobody else that was around. They were both naked. They noticed there were some differences about them, but they seemed to like that. But like little children who don't realize that. Uh, I, two of my kids, you couldn't keep, once they figured out how to take clothes off, that was the end. Um, and they just did. Thank God they did it at home until we were able to try to get them to keep clothes on them when we got them out in public. But they would go out in the backyard and we look out there and huh, they're naked. Because they were naked and unashamed. They didn't know any better. It was, it was summertime. That, you know, it was warm outside. It wasn't like it was snowy. But human beings come out of the womb naked and for a long time don't realize till we tell them, don't do that anymore. That's not right. You need to cover up parts and don't let anybody touch those parts, which is entirely appropriate. We don't want anybody looking at them. Don't want anybody seeing them. But great question. Who told you were, you were naked? And Adam does what we do when we're caught. He says, the man said, verse 12, the woman whom you put here, and you know how they are, God. You made them. You know how they are. The woman whom you put here, she gave me some from the tree and I ate it. Not my fault. You know, you put her here. She tripped me up. I was, you know, I wasn't thinking right. She gave it to me. I didn't know any better. It's her fault. What do we do when we get caught? That wasn't me. I didn't mean to. It really doesn't matter. It was their fault. They... Uh, okay, so then God, the, the Lord says to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the snake. <laughs> the snake deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So here's the scene. They eat the fruit. Their eyes are open. Uh-oh, they make some coverings. God comes in the garden. They go, uh-oh, they hide. God says, come on out. Where are you? I hid because I was naked and ashamed. Who told you you were naked? The woman that you made. Adam blames God. Adam blames her. Does he take any responsibility at all? Not a one. The woman, the snake, he tricked me. Does she, like she takes no responsibility. I've always wondered what would have what would God have done 
had when they heard him in the garden, they ran out and they said, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. We messed up. We did what you told us not to. The New Testament tells us if we will confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's an eternal truth. What would have happened? Us and still let the what happen. would have? We don't know. We never. I, I'm going to ask God when I get there. What would have <laughs> happened? What would you have done? But they had. When they heard God, they could have come clean. When He said, "Where are you?" they could have come clean. When God said, "Who told you you were naked?" they could have come clean. They could have come clean when Adam could have come clean. Eve could have come clean. There were at least five chances they could have come clean, and they didn't. And God, in His grace and His mercy, didn't go, and I'll make some more. I, there's plenty of dirt. I'll make another one and start all over. God says, no, He's going to stick with these two that He made. And so He rears up to curse, and I imagine Adam and Eve going, and the curse goes on the snake. You're going to crawl on your belly, eat dust all your life. What else does it say? Verse 15, I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Ladies, any of you afraid of snakes? Oh, yeah. Okay, it's biblical. It's okay. It's in the Bible. If you're afraid of snakes, it's all right. Here it is. But I will put hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Now, wait a minute. Can women have offspring by themselves? No. Only once. No. Only once was a virgin conceive and have a child. So here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God is already looking ahead to how he's going to fix this, that there will be an offspring of a woman who is going to crush the head of the serpent. Now in the movie, The, um, the Passion of the Christ, in there, remember, Slick Satan keeps showing up every once in a while. In the Garden of Eden, Jesus is there praying. And as he's praying, you look down, you see this snake come out. And Jesus stomps it with his foot. That's, the fo That's Mel Gibson's version of fulfilling this promise right here. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. You will pierce his heel. That Satan will pierce the foot of this offspring of a woman, think nails in the feet, but he will crush your head. And in the movie Passion of the Christ, in that scene, Jesus crushes the head of the serpent. On the cross, Jesus destroys the work of the devil. He destroys death and makes all things new by his resurrection. So in Genesis chapter Three is the fall that human beings fall from grace, fall out of this perfect relationship with God, fall out of this perfect relationship with each other. Selfishness infects them. Sin and selfishness infects them. And we're going to see infects the entire creation. But God in verse 15 says, I'm going to do something about this. You can't fix this. But I got a plan. Verse 16, to the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbirth very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And in this part of the consequences, the male-female husband-wife relationship gets twisted. And childbearing becomes painful, more painful than it would have been otherwise that we know of. Nobody, she had not had any children up to this point, so we don't know. But it becomes painful, and I'm not going to ask for any stories, any of you that had children, um, your, how many ever hours of labor and all of that sort of stuff, but we'll take your word for it, it hurts. Okay. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And from the beginning, women have tended to, to want a relationship with their husband. And husbands too often have tended to rule over their wives. They have been unkind. They have overstepped their bounds. Not all of them all the time, but the tendency tends to 
often tends to be that way. And where a woman wants a relationship and a partnership, the guy's like, oh, I, I, I want sex and I want, I, you know, I want you to do what I want. I'm bring, you know, I want you to do what I want you to do because we're all selfish. And the selfishness of both males and females have twisted this relationship. And so, but whom did God curse so far? Only the serpent. He's not cursed the woman. Well, the curse continues. Verse 17. To Adam, he says, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Now, is God saying, Don't listen to your husbands, don't listen to your wives? No, he's not saying that. He's saying this time. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Don't you love it when the Bible quotes the prayer book? <laughs> from the Ash Wednesday service. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And this is where that comes from in the Book of Common Prayer. So the curse goes on the snake. There's consequences for the woman. The curse goes on the ground. Were there thorns and thistles before this? We don't know. But there certainly are after this. And human beings have had to scratch a living out of the earth ever since. Now, most of us are not farmers anymore. Some of us grow plants. Some of us still work in the dirt. But those of us who don't grow plants and work in the dirt, whatever it is that we do, we swap our resources to people who work in the dirt, who grow our food, don't we? Mm -hmm. So all of it goes back to scratching a living out of the earth, whether it's growing crops or animals for meat, however it is that we scratch this living out of the earth. Somebody's doing the scratching. The rest of us may be paying them to do it. But for centuries and eons, everybody had to do that. It's only been in the last uh, couple of thousand years that human beings have figured out divisions of labor that everybody didn't have to grow everything and make everything on their own. But you still have to work, don't you? And by the sweat of my brow, and all of us who have jobs, is your job all fun all the time? I hope it's fun some of the time. But there are many people throughout history who have had sucky jobs that were sucked all the time. But that's, here it is. Is that the curse? No, that's the consequences. That's the consequences. So Adam and Eve both suffer consequences. Neither the woman nor the man is cursed. The serpent is cursed. The earth is cursed. And because the earth is cursed, we reap the consequences of the curse on the earth. Well, then what happens? Verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Well, did she have a name before this? We don't know. We don't know when he named her that. Okay. Verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them because fig leaves don't cut it. <laughs> they don't cover very much and they're not very durable made skin, made uh, clothes of skin for Adam and his wife Eve. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat it and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. And after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You can't go back in there. Where do you get animal skins? From dead animals. From dead animals. So the lot, we can infer from this that God killed the first animals and showed Adam how to skin them to make clothing out of skin. And one can also infer from that that this was the first sacrifice. That God showed Adam, okay, because you sinned to cover you up, this animal has to die. And we're shedding this animal's blood to cover your nakedness, to cover your exposure, to cover your mistake. 
And from this we can infer, the Bible does not spell this out, but it doesn't take long before the next chapter, Cain and Abel are making sacrifices, including animal sacrifices. Did they just come up, that, come up with that on their own? Probably not. And we can infer from this that God is the one who introduced the sacrificial system. You say, well, that's just yucky. Yes, it is. Read Leviticus. It gets even yuckier. Well, that's not fair that an animal dies for human sin. Well, we can only die for we can die for our own sin only once. Does that mean that we want to die for our sins? Well, you can do it once. Uh, you wouldn't be sinning very long, would you? And so to be able to kill an animal in our place as a substitute, that we shed the animal's blood instead of our own, that's part of God's grace. Tough on the animals, yeah. But it's grace for us humans that God would allow us to substitute an animal for our own. And this is how it goes for centuries, for several thousand years, until it's ingrained in the Hebrew people that if you sin, it's going to cost you a goat or a lamb or a pigeon or a bull. Something's got to shed blood to take care of your sin, to atone for your, to wipe out your sin. And so by the time Jesus comes along, offers himself as a sacrifice on the cross, and when John the Baptist points at Jesus says, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, well, after 2,000 years of, of Hebrew history, oh, they all understood exactly what John's saying. No, he's not a lamb, he's a human being. But if he's the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, then he's going to take my sin. Somehow he's going to substitute himself for me, his blood. And when John the Baptist says that, John the Baptist probably doesn't really understand what he's saying. He's speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But we on the other side of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection can go, oh, okay. So you walk into our parish hall or our church and you look on the front of the altar and there is the Lamb of God carved into the front of the altar because the altar is the place on which we make sacrifices. And the, what the Hebrews tended to sacrifice was a lamb every morning and every evening, every day, plus what they offered for their sin. So that lamb on the front of the altar says to us what goes on the altar, which has the crucifix behind the altar, that that's the lamb of God, that on the cross and that on the altar. Did the same thing on the altar as Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice in our place to substitute for us, to take our sin and selfishness upon him, to take away the consequences of our mistakes and our selfishness. So all of this begins back here in Genesis chapter 3. God does, appears to do the first sacrifice, then kicks them out. What happened to the tree of life? And where's the Garden of Eden? We don't know. Throughout the ages, people have conjectured where it might be because in Genesis chapter 2, it talks about these four rivers that are there. Not four rivers barbecue, but four rivers that are there. And so they've looked at different geographical places on earth where there are these four river sort of things that happen and they've guessed it's in Florida, they've guessed it's in Mesopotamia. It names two of the rivers in Genesis chapter 2, says Tigris and Euphrates. Oh, that would be in what is today Iraq. So we don't know where Eden was. Where's the tree of life? If you found it, could you eat from it and eat, live forever? That'd even better than Ponce de Leon looking for the fountain of youth, wouldn't it? But you really want to live Where's the tree of life? Turn to the last page of your Bible. Genesis, um, Revelation chapter 22. Genesis chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 22. Describing heaven. Describing the new Jerusalem. The angel showed me the river of water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit in every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The tree of life was transplanted. 
into to heaven, to that new Jerusalem. We will eat from the tree of life at some point. But God guarded it there in the Garden of Eden so they could not get to it. Now we're going to, as, as you read the ensuing chapters, these people live hundreds and hundreds of years. How is that? Is that? right? Did they really live that long? Are they just making this up? Are those symbolic numbers or what? Well, if God created human beings to live forever in the first place, it is, shouldn't be surprising that they live six, seven, eight, nine hundred years, which is still not forever. And from our perspective, that's a long time. Well, at age 900, did they look nine times as, ten times as old as 90-year-olds do today? Probably not. Aging would have I would have imagined aging would have taken the same thing. So you'd be 100 years old at that point. You're just a teenager. But it didn't take long for the consequences of sin to take its toll on human bodies and the human, on human beings so that now we deal with cancer and arthritis and degenerative dis disease and cysts and pimples and blemishes and ingrown hairs and ingrown toenails and all of those things about our bodies that go wrong. And the older you get, the worse it gets, right? Looking around this room, yeah, yeah, all of us. The older you get, the worse it gets. It's not, that's right. Getting old is not for sissies. And the aging process that entered into the world because it came with sin and sickness. Sin and sickness go together. Does that mean every sickness is a result of sin? Not necessarily. There are some that are. But sickness is an eventual, is part of that whole bent and broken world that we live in that we have accidents and we have injuries and we have environmental things that you eat or drink that you didn't know any better. You didn't know it was, it was going to make you sick. It was somebody else's sin. Or it was ignorance. Uh, I grew up in the South where, you know, we ate fried everything. The day they tell us that's not the wisest thing to yeah, eat. But they didn't necessarily die young. They worked really hard. So. And when they died of a heart attack, they were happy. They got to eat biscuits and gravy for breakfast that morning. Bacon. <laughs> Bacon. Yeah, all of that stuff. The point being that sin, as it entered the world and spread throughout the world, spread through our human bodies and people's lifespans shrunk. Now, they're expanding a little bit now because of our medical care. But, you know, there's a top end there someplace. Every once in a while, somebody makes it past 110. But not very often. We'll see. Okay, so they're kicked out of the garden. The tree of life is transplanted to Revelation 22. And the rest of the scriptures are God seeking to turn this thing around. People had it perfect in the beginning. They messed it up and turned the world upside down by their disobedience and their selfishness. And the rest of the scriptures is God working not to turn the world upside down, but to turn it right side up. And Jesus is the main part of that. His first coming that dealt with sin and his second coming that will deal with death. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Any questions so far? And I meant to ask you in some beginning. Any questions from your reading? I forgot so to ask So we read that. all of Genesis. You're going to finish the rest of Genesis for next week. Yes. I have a question. Yes, Nancy. Okay, because when I was a child and read this, um, it's like, why didn't they just go to the tree of life first and then, then go to the tree of good and evil? You know, would things have been different? It would have been different. But when somebody tells you not to do something, where do you go first? Yeah. You go check it out. Fruits, yeah. Go check it out. And if I'm not supposed to do that, that must be the fun one. Yeah. Yeah. I have a daughter like that. I'm like that. I thought you were an handful. Still am. <laughs> Any other questions from your reading? Uh, John MacArthur taught, and I have his study Bible, and I'm not a big fan of it, but uh, he talks about the lifespan shortening. Mm -hmm. He says it has to do with pre-flood versus post-flood. 
with the idea that the atmosphere was different before the flood and then after the flood everything changed? That's a possibility. Okay. Because lifespans did shorten a lot from before the flood yeah. to after the flood. According to what the scriptures say, yes. They were only living 120, 150 years after the flood. That's a short and after that too, because it went from like 120 or more to these four year, years and 10. Years. Right, Eight. yeah, 70. Right. Yeah. Well, let us pray. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet, must yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, Grant that we may share the divine life of Him who humbled Himself to share our humanity, Your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with You in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.